This is India, a nation of more than 1.4 billion people and the world's fastest growing major economy. It's also a country with undisputable technological, economic and military potential. A nation that was able to land a probe on the moon for 75 million US dollars, built its first nuclear weapon less than 30 years after independence, and which today maintains perhaps the second largest active duty military in the world, buoyed by a long and often distinguished military history. However, it's also a country that spent more than a decade working on an indigenous assault rifle to replace foreign designs, only to now be in the process of retiring that rifle for replacement by foreign designs. A country which spent more than 30 years developing a fighter jet engine that still isn't in service. A nation which has spent more than 20 years trying to acquire submarines through Project 75, something that may now not deliver its first boats until the late 2020s or early 2030s and which has such a spotty record on military procurement for everything from green tea to jet fighters, that in some cases well-trained veteran fighter pilots are required to continue flying old MiG-21s, a design dating back to the 1960s, which has soldiered on well past its prime. The story of modern India's military is that of a growing major power, a globally significant actor with immense potential, marred by challenges in investment, modernization, and reform. And today, at long last, we're going to talk about it. We'll start with a brief history of the development of the Indian Armed Forces and India's strategic environment. Then we'll do the numbers, look at the Indian Armed Forces as they exist today, and then look at some of the strengths and challenges India faces in fielding and modernising such a large military force. That'll lead into a discussion of what I consider one of the most interesting parts of the Indian military story. A look at India's defence industry and major arms suppliers, the efforts of successive governments to steadily indigenise more defence production within India, why so many Indian military procurements have often gone so far over time or over budget that it sometimes makes Canadian and German military procurement look like a high-speed, low-drag operation. To close out, we'll then reverse that story a little bit and look at some of the great successes of Indian industry, explaining why, despite some of the challenges it faces, there's immense potential here for a rising major military power. But before I jump into it, a quick word from a sponsor. And today, I once again get to welcome back my chosen VPN, Private Internet Access. If you're watching this video, I'm going to make a wild assumption that you use the internet. And as I've said before, in the 2020s, protecting your privacy online can sometimes seem like something of an impossible task. In a sense, you might compare something like browsing on a public network without a VPN to batting in a game like baseball or cricket without something as basic as a helmet or a mouth guard. The vast majority of the time, you might be okay. But if your luck ever turns, you're probably going to be happy you took the precaution. A VPN probably won't totally eliminate risk, but combined with good practices like sensible browsing and passwords that don't resemble people's birthdays, it can probably help mitigate it. What a VPN can allow you to do is reroute your internet traffic, change your publicly perceived IP address, and also to an extent, control how that activity is recorded and logged. That's significant because private internet access have been pretty clear that they have a no-logs policy which has been independently audited and tested in court. Notably, their software is also open source and available cross-platform. And while private internet access has always given you the flexibility to connect to servers worldwide, their list is now expanded to 91 countries, including dedicated IP hubs in popular locations like Brussels, Houston, and Silicon Valley. The VPN's compatible with a range of streaming services, but unlike some of those services, won't put a restriction on how many devices you cover with one subscription. Meaning if, like me, you want it on your phone and multiple computers, just one subscription will do. And so if you're interested, there is a link in the description that you might want to go check out. It'll offer you 83% off a two-year subscription, plus four bonus months covering an unlimited number of devices, and covered by a 30-day money-back guarantee. And even better for some of you listening, they've now launched their privacy pass. This is a special free subscription that they advertise as being available to groups like NGOs, charities, journalists, or those delivering humanitarian aid in areas where digital privacy is under threat. So if you fall into one of those categories, you may also want to check them out. So with my thanks once more, let's get back to the episode. So to understand the journey the modern Indian military is on, it helps to have a bit of background into how that force evolved. And I choose that limited scope on purpose because it would be a brave person indeed to try and fit the entire history of India or militaries in India into a 10-minute segment. Because remember, while we might think of India as just one modern country... This is a nation of 1.4 billion people with a history of civilization dating back millennia. It might be one nation, but it's an incredibly diverse one. You can spend time in an Indian city, and I have spent time in India, but if you were then to claim you understood all of India as a result, it would be kind of like spending some time in Italy and claiming you understood Europe. I wanted to go land in Stockholm and explain to the locals in perfect Italian 
that you are looking forward to experiencing more of their traditional pasta dishes. Indian military history is much the same. The subcontinent has seen empires rise and fall. It's seen independent princely states raise their own military forces and periods of invasion and foreign domination. And it's that last element that made a significant contribution towards shaping the modern Indian force. In the first half of the 20th century before Indian independence, the primary armed force on the Indian subcontinent was the British Indian Army, which initially had a very significant divide between the British officers and the Indian enlisted personnel, but which especially after the First World War went through a process of Indianization, where Indians began to be promoted to more and more higher officer ranks and sent to study at institutions like the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst. During the First and Second World Wars, millions of Indians would serve. That service wouldn't be without cost, with approximately 87,000 Indian soldiers losing their lives during the Second World War alone. Leaving aside any of the political implications of the force, what it meant for India and Pakistan, unlike many other states that would later achieve their independence from Britain, was that they inherited millions of veterans with military experience, stockpiles of existing equipment, a military command structure, and a cadre of experienced officers. When India and Pakistan gained their independence in 1947, the various elements of the Indian army were basically cut up and divided between the two. The British officers obviously mostly went home, but otherwise, the equipment, the bases, the infrastructure, and many of the units found themselves divided between the Dominion of India and the Dominion of Pakistan, who, of course, because history hates happy endings apparently, almost immediately pointed a lot of that equipment at each other, and fought the Indo-Pakistani War of 1947, otherwise known as the First Kashmir War. In the decades that followed, the Indian military would fight a mixture of conventional land wars, counterinsurgency, skirmishes, and internal security support operations. Most of the larger scale conflicts would be, unsurprisingly, with Pakistan. With the army winning perhaps its most decisive victory in the Quick War of 1971, while also suffering occasional reverses, as in the Sino-Indian War of 1962. Don't worry, we'll get back to both of those later. The key element, however, is that most of modern India's military engagements have been land wars, skirmishes, or conflicts. But as India's economy and prominence in global affairs has grown, so too have its military and political ambitions. The Indian government's so-called Act East policy calls for the nation to be more proactive in building relations with nations in Southeast Asia. And while that's overwhelmingly an economic and diplomatic policy, there may be some crossover with defence strategy. India is now very much visibly in the process of transforming into a more regional power, expanding its navy with power projection tools like aircraft carriers and nuclear submarines, while also investing in more modern and longer-range missiles and strike systems, capable of projecting power not just to targets in Pakistan, but also considerably further afield. That apparent ongoing evolution in the Indian military arguably reflects a couple of factors, not least of which are the realities of the country's geography, strategic context, and changing ambitions. In geographical terms, in a lot of ways, India's got a pretty incredible position, to the point where if this was a multiplayer game, you'd probably accuse the Indian player of rigging the map generation system, at least until you saw the unbalanced bullshit that is the continental United States. The country's great river systems and rich farmlands supported thousands of years of civilization. Trade is facilitated by an incredible strategic position dominating the Indian Ocean, and the country has an enormous variety, if not unlimited supply, of natural resources. At the same time, that very strong strategic position also imposes challenges on any Indian defence planner, including the country's dependence on international trade. India has, for example, plenty of refining infrastructure to turn raw oil into refined products, but that oil needs to be imported. So keeping hydrocarbons flowing from the Middle East and Russia, coal from Australia and a huge variety of other inputs from critical trading partners like China, the United States and European Union is absolutely essential. That means for India, freedom of navigation on the sea lanes to the west, heading towards the Middle East and Europe, or to the east, heading into the Pacific, is non-negotiable from a security perspective. At the same time, the country has territorial disputes with some of its neighbours, most notably in the somewhat famous Kashmir region, much of which is subject to contesting claims by Pakistan, India, and the People's Republic of China. These are examples of factors that might pull Indian strategic priorities in diverging directions, towards broader regional concerns and a focus on naval power on one hand, and the risk of both conventional and unconventional warfare and escalation on land. Unlike the UK or Japan, India can't just plough all its resources into the Navy and Air Force and let geographical realities handle much of the rest. India, for better or worse, has to try and find a way to either do it all 
or make some hard sacrifices. That geographic analysis should probably give you a little bit of a clue as to who India regards as its primary military threats and competitors. I've said in one of my other videos that it's a big ask to get two-thirds of a population in any democracy to agree on anything. But of course, there are exceptions if you do want to get a one-sided result. You could ask the Americans what they think of freedom, the Brits what they think of soccer, a game they notably continue to insist on calling football, or you could ask the Indians what they think of Pakistan. Remember that both India and Pakistan were products of the partition of British India in 1947. That partition drove the displacement and mass movement of somewhere between 10 and 20 million people, significant outbreaks of violence, and would cause the loss of human life on a massive scale. India and Pakistan would go on to fight significant wars in 1947, 1965, 1971, the 1999 Cargill War, and a huge variety of skirmishes and unconventional actions in between. And of course, both nations have nuclear weapons, largely built with the other country in mind, and nothing builds positive bilateral relationships quite like having weapons of mass destruction trained on each other. As you might expect then, according to Pew Research Centre polling, Indians who have a negative opinion towards Pakistan outnumber those who have a favourable view of the country by something like 3.7 to 1. And an absolute majority of all survey respondents, 57%, said that they have a very unfavourable view of the country. But interestingly, from a security perspective, according to the Indian military, Pakistan is no longer the country's number one security threat. In part, that might be because India's growing economy and military strength has meant it's been able to establish a degree of conventional superiority over Pakistan. Instead, in 2021, India's defence chief came out and said that the People's Republic of China, not Pakistan, was the nation's biggest security threat. In strategic terms from an Indian perspective, there are some things in common between Beijing and Islamabad. China, like Pakistan, has border disputes with India. Like Pakistan, those border disputes have occasionally spilled over to skirmishes in recent years that have claimed lives. And as with Pakistan, a majority of the surveyed Indian public expresses a negative opinion towards the country. In 2023, more than two-thirds of Indian respondents to the aforementioned survey expressed an unfavourable opinion towards China, and about half said they thought the PRC did nothing to contribute to global peace and stability. It's important to stress here that China-India relations are not monodimensional. China is still India's most significant trading partner, for example. But in terms of security and regional competition, recent years have often been frosty. Certainly nowhere near as bad as they were in 1962, when India and China would fight the quick Sino-Indian War, but still not exactly warm. In 2023, for example, India appeared to quite publicly side with the Philippines against Chinese territorial claims in the South China Sea. It did so by calling for adherence to a 2016 international judgment that had largely sided with the Philippines. While I'm sure the Philippines welcomed the diplomatic support, the record doesn't clearly show whether or not they appreciated India's supply of military equipment, like for example the BrahMos anti-ship cruise missile, even more. The so-called line of actual control separating Indian and Chinese forces along that disputed border should probably take a nomination for one of the strangest border flashpoints in the world. To avoid the risk of mass casualties and rapid military escalation, both sides have agreed that troops operating near the line of actual control will carry firearms, but historically at least by agreement, won't use them in any face-off or confrontation. Soldiers being soldiers, however, no one wants to go on patrol without a weapon of some kind, leading the world to witness the sight of major military powers in the 21st century having skirmishes in which their troops fought it out using literal sticks and clubs. We even have some visual evidence of troops leaning into the whole fallout experience, fashioning improvised weapons like clubs wrapped in barbed wire. Now, on one hand, you might observe that Einstein once said that World War IV would be fought with sticks and stones, but here at least it seems that China and India are already there. On the other hand, the agreement, the restriction, serves an obvious purpose. Like fighters deliberately agreeing to bring knives to a tank fight, it does serve to help limit the risk of out-of-control escalation, something neither of the countries involved wants. Nonetheless, these clashes have claimed multiple lives and certainly haven't done anything good for bilateral relations. Nor does the fact that Pakistan and China appear to have grown much closer in recent years. China is a major provider of finance for Islamabad and increasingly a key weapons supplier. The Pakistani Air Force, for example, has been significantly augmented by shipments of Chinese jets like the J-10, the joint development of the JF-17, and the provision of Chinese missiles and subsystems to go with both the above. In 2012, China accounted for 58% of Pakistan's weapons imports and the United States 27%. 
By 2022, despite Pakistan being about as cashed up as your average Gen Z fine arts graduate, annual arms imports had actually increased by almost 50% in trend indicator value terms over 2012, and China's market share had grown for a remarkable near 87%, followed by Belgium in second, with just over 4%. By contrast, Indian diplomatic relations and public opinion towards both the United States and Russia are relatively positive. For those who are used to viewing world affairs through a very Washington or Moscow-focused lens, this can be somewhat confusing. Since the war in Ukraine broke out, for example, I've seen many questions in the comments asking whose side, in inverted commas, India is on. And there, the most reasonable answer I can come up with is that India is on India's side. During the Cold War, the country was a leader of the so-called non-aligned movement, a group of countries which expressed non-alignment with either the Soviet or US-led power blocs. Positive relations were pursued with both Washington and Moscow, and to an extent, that's the same policy we see in place today. Indian diplomatic relations with Washington are strong. The countries are major trading partners and cooperate on security issues. The fact that India is also the world's largest democracy is also commonly cited as a reason for the strong relations between the two countries. When surveyed on their opinions of the United States, most of the data I've seen suggests that the Indian population is overwhelmingly positive. About two-thirds of surveyed Indian respondents had a favourable view of the US overall, about 70% so they believed it actively contributed to peace and stability, and about 49% of respondents said they thought US influence in the world was growing stronger, and only 14% thought it was getting weaker. Overall, it's probably fair to say the USA has a lot of friends in India, hundreds of millions of them in fact, and that relationship has significant strategic significance for both Washington and New Delhi. But a majority of the Indian public also has a positive opinion of Russia and Vladimir Putin. With a vast majority of Indian respondents supporting the continuation of the oil trade with Russia, and the Indian military still very publicly exercising with their Russian equivalents, while defence industry cooperation with Russia continues in a range of areas. Again, at first glance, this might seem like a contradictory position to take. But the more you dig into the history of the region, the more you can see how we might have got to this point. During the Cold War, for example, there were often occasions where the US and India arguably found themselves on different sides, as was the case, particularly notably, in 1971. At the time, Pakistan was divided between East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, and West Pakistan, which is the Pakistan we know today. There were considerable tensions between these two geographically separated parts of ostensibly the same country. For various reasons, support for self-determination and independence in East Pakistan would grow over time leading to an eventual response by the Pakistani military. This was an operation codenamed Operation Searchlight. Almost nothing about it is YouTube-friendly, and so I would encourage you to Google it on your own time. Suffice to say, however, that the human cost to the civilians of the region was immense. In India, calls grew for military intervention, and on the 3rd of December 1971, the Pakistani Air Force launched what was intended to be a preemptive strike on Indian Air Force bases, in an attack that was supposedly modelled after the Israeli Air Force's efforts during the Six-Day War. Unfortunately for Pakistan, this was very much a we-have-operation-focus-back-home situation. The attacks very much didn't knock out the Indian Air Force, and the result was about two weeks of conventional force-on-force demolition. The Indian military rapidly established air supremacy in the east, and within two weeks inflicted more than 30,000 casualties and forced the surrender of more than 90,000. It was a rapid and one-sided affair that would ultimately secure the independence of what is now Bangladesh. But as the events had unfolded, the US had largely sided with Pakistan. This was the Cold War, and the US saw Pakistan as an ally against communism. The US at the time was also trying to build relations with Beijing, building on the Sino-Soviet split, and Beijing favoured Pakistan over India. As Pakistan's military situation deteriorated, On the 11th of December, the US went so far as to dispatch the carrier USS Enterprise and its escorts to the Bay of Bengal. Reportedly, many in India interpreted this as a significant threat. The Soviet Navy, however, sent nuclear-armed assets of its own to the region, implicitly providing some cover for the Indians. 1971 is a long time ago, but this was a conflict that shaped the fate of millions. It also led to a significant disruption of broader diplomatic patterns in the region. After the conflict, the United States would dedicate considerable resources to expanding its relationship with India, while the Soviet Union would engage in a number of ways with Pakistan. But the core point is that India has often had to rely on different friends at different times. And in 1971, that ally was not Richard Nixon.
And to this day, India arguably demonstrates a tendency towards what one might call diplomatic flexibility. On one hand, for example, India is a major part of the so-called BRICS grouping, alongside the People's Republic of China, Russia, South Africa and Brazil, with more countries on the way. I really want to talk about BRICS more in the future, but for now suffice to say the organisation isn't a military alliance. Instead, it's a largely economically focused organisation. And so India seems to have sought to use its participation to advance several of its economic goals, including, among other things, balancing the international dominance of the US dollar and internationalising the Indian rupee. But at the same time, jump over to security issues and India is part of the so-called Quad. This is a group made up of India, Japan, the United States and some other country in the Southern Hemisphere that we really don't need to talk about, to get together to discuss security issues and to stage the occasional military exercise that absolutely positively has nothing to do with any particular country at all. Geopolitically, it's a very different group of friends, but it's also a different core issue. And it highlights the fact that geopolitically, India appears to be willing to maintain relations across the line, so to speak, working with whatever partners best align with its interests in any particular policy area. Militarily, it also provides clues as to India's increasing ambitions, to be able to act not just within its own territories or on its land borders, but also to project power and influence across its region. All in all, it'd be pretty odd to be investing resources in naval exercises in the Pacific if your only concern was a land war in northwest India. And so with that context in place, let's have a look at the Indian military. In military terms, India is a land power first and foremost, to such an extent that even though China's People Liberation Army as a whole has more personnel than the Indian regular military, the Indian army, at more than 1.2 million strong, is the largest regular ground combat force in the world. The army has a significant supply of heavy equipment, mostly Soviet or post-Soviet in nature, including approximately 3,700 active tanks, mostly T-90s or T-72s, more than 3,000 infantry fighting vehicles, mostly BMP-2s, and a significant inventory of artillery, multiple launch rocket systems and ground-based air defences, with that last category including both advanced imported equipment like the Russian S-400, as well as thousands of locally designed and manufactured Akash missiles. Indian leaders have noted that significant parts of the army's equipment are getting a little bit old and probably require recapitalization, but with a theoretical mobilized strength of more than 2 million active personnel, this might be a situation where, at least for now, quantity can sometimes have a quality all of its own. The Indian Navy is very much the third child of the Indian military family, by far the smallest of the arms with about 71,000 active personnel, but also the one that is arguably going through the most radical expansions and changes. As India's economic and military power has grown, so too have the ambitions of the Navy. The force now has two active aircraft carriers and it's looking increasingly likely that they'll also get a third. Many Indian warships are domestically manufactured but have a degree of Soviet or post-Soviet DNA. That said, Indian military shipbuilding has steadily advanced generation by generation. Just to take India's destroyers, for example, the old Rajput class was a modified Soviet Project 61 built in Ukraine for the Indian Navy. It was followed up by a modified and enhanced version, the Delhi class, that was built in India. That design was then iterated into India's three Project 15A ships, and then finally into the P-15B guided missile destroyers complete with modern stealth features, advanced sensors and a variety of upgrades, to the point where any resemblance to the old Soviet design is starting to get a little bit stretched. Going forward, India has a lot of ambitions resting on its navy. India's Act East policy seeking to build relationships and influence out into the Asia-Pacific is obviously mostly about diplomacy, trade and economics. But when it comes to making friends and building influence, the ability to project is important. And sometimes nothing projects friendship and goodwill quite like a carrier air wing. In personnel terms, the Indian Air Force is about twice the size of the Navy, about 140,000 active personnel. On paper, the Indian Air Force is one of the largest combat air forces in the world. It's also, however, significantly under its authorised strength. The Indian Air Force, for example, is meant to have 42 fighter squadrons. It currently has, I believe, 31. And within that 31 squadrons is a fascinating mix of high and low capability platforms. The most numerous parts of the force, for example, are Sukhoi-30 MKI jets designed in Russia but largely manufactured in India, and the better part of 200 Anglo-French Jaguars serving in the ground attack and training roles. There's also an eclectic mix of imported and domestic products. French-designed Mirage 2000s, A-50 AWACS aircraft from Russia refitted with Israeli radars, and Hawk trainers from the United Kingdom. But perhaps the most interesting thing about India's stable of combat aircraft 
is just how wide the gap in capability is between the best and the least advanced platforms. To the point where if the oldest and youngest fighters in the Indian fleet ever pulled up a little too close to one another after flying a mission, even Hollywood celebrities would probably be asking the ground crews to push them just a bit further apart because everyone's going to have limits. At the top of the range, for example, there are Indian pilots that get to fly imported French Rafales or domestically built Sukhoi 30s. The Rafales aren't just the most advanced aircraft in the fleet, they're also armed with the Meteor air-to-air missiles, giving them a massive potential advantage against most of the targets they're likely to encounter. So if you're very lucky with your Air Force posting in India, you might find yourself flying something pretty top-notch. On the other hand, if you roll a critical fail when it comes to get your assignment, you might find yourself flying the MiG-21. This aircraft was a competitive interceptor when it entered service with the Indian Air Force in 1963. The aircraft have gone through upgrades over the years, but by modern air combat standards, these things are fossils. Relics of an earlier era and indications of a wider problem the Indian Air Force is suffering from. And that's the fact that a lot of the aircraft in India's inventory are starting to get a bit old and are going to need to be retired eventually. The Jaguars are reportedly meant to start their phase-out in the mid to late 2020s and complete their phase-out by the early to mid-2030s, and the last MiG-21s are finally meant to be gone later this decade. The challenge then is India looking to build up its fighter strength to 42 or 43 squadrons, while at the same time retiring hundreds of existing platforms. Doing that would require a massive and successful aircraft procurement effort. And as we'll get to in a bit, the record of the Indian military when it comes to major procurements is a bit mixed. As well as the regular Indian military, I also want to give a call out to India's border and paramilitary forces. India controls a massive territory, huge population, and has historically faced a wide array of unconventional internal threats. Dealing with those issues requires manpower, but not necessarily firepower. And so in 2022, Military Balance estimated that India had something like 1.6 million personnel against a variety of border and internal security forces. Those included the State Armed Police, the Railway Protection Force, the Central Reserve Police Force, the Central Industrial Security Force, the Border Security Force, as well as some quite storied organisations like the 65,000 strong Assam Rifles. Some of these units, like the Rifles, have considerable reputations, but have a force design that reflects the fact that unless you're going up against a peer military opponent or run a US police department, you probably don't need a bunch of armoured vehicles and heavy and expensive equipment. In that way, on paper, many of these border and security forces can take light and internal duties away from regular army units, leaving army units more focused on roles that actually require you to roll in the tanks. But to move to completely the other end of the firepower spectrum for a moment, if your goal is not so much internal security but deterring a potentially nuclear-armed state actor, then you're going to need a lot more than small arms and light vehicles. And if the prospect of fighting through a military that can muster millions of personnel, thousands of armoured vehicles and hundreds of combat aircraft doesn't give an opponent pause, India does have a final ace up its sleeve. Its status as one of the world's few nuclear weapon states. India commands an interesting position in the history of nuclear weapons. By the standards of the day, the first Indian nuclear device tested in May 1974 was a relatively humble design. Remember, this is a period of time where the Soviet Union and the United States were basically fighting a sustained thermonuclear war against Kazakhstan and Nevada, respectively. By comparison, India's test device was a relatively simple design with a low kiloton range yield. But despite the small, in relative terms, nuclear blast, it was still very much heard around the world. Because this was the first time a nuclear device had been detonated by a country that was neither a permanent member of the UN Security Council nor a recognised nuclear weapons state in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. From that point, however, the Indian program expanded relatively slowly. India wouldn't test nuclear weapons again until 1998, when it detonated five in quick succession as part of the Pokhran II tests. Those tests provided practical proof of the ability of the Indians to build larger yield nuclear devices, with one of the five detonations being a fusion design. The test resulted in India attracting international sanctions from a number of major powers, but also, to paraphrase the words of the Indian Prime Minister at the time, marked the country's transition to being a full-fledged nuclear weapons state. But despite the tests, India's nuclear weapons policy remained relatively constrained. To this day, India states that it has a nuclear no-first-use policy, meaning it won't be the first to press the nuclear button, except in the case of an opponent using nuclear, biological or chemical weapons first. In doctrinal terms, that gives India's nuclear weapons a very narrow role compared to those, for example, of the United States marking them, above all, as weapons of deterrence or retaliation. Most estimates mark India's current nuclear weapons inventory as one of the smallest of the nuclear weapon states. Recent warhead estimates tend to sit around the 160 mark, 
with a majority of those being intended for either land-based ballistic missiles or air-delivered dumb bombs. It should be noted, though, that even those relatively humble numbers, or at least however humble you can be when talking about weapons of mass destruction, shouldn't conceal the fact that this is a nuclear force that is undergoing constant modernization. For example, as recently as 2003, India was still an air-delivered only nuclear weapon state, meaning it only had nuclear weapons that were deployed from aircraft. And in terms of inventory management in the future, the country is probably much more like China than the United States or Russia. This is not a fully developed, diversified nuclear weapon state that went into a post-Cold War pause and is now updating its inventory. Instead, it's a country that is still in the development and expansion phase of being a nuclear power. The production facilities don't need to be restarted or rebuilt because they never stopped. India has been rolling out a succession of ballistic missile designs capable of delivering warheads at much longer ranges and in a manner which is much harder for opposing defences to intercept. The other factor is India's efforts to bulk out its nuclear triad. That is, its ability to combine air, land and sea-based nuclear weapons into a single coherent deterrent. The air and land components are obviously fairly mature and the land component is continuing to evolve with new generations of ballistic missiles. But a lot of signs point to the fact that Indian nuclear strategists might still be a little bit concerned about the capabilities of the sea-based leg. Some of India's at-sea nuclear weapons, for example, are still slated for delivery by relatively short range, so approximately 300 kilometre range, missiles on surface warships. But in this era of long-range anti-ship missiles and increasingly capable submarines, relying on the ability to get a surface warship within 300 kilometres of an opposing strategic target, like a major city, is probably more risk than most forces would prefer to take. India obviously has a plan to move away from those sort of weapons, which is to adopt more ballistic missile submarines. India's first class of SSBN is relatively small by global standards. The first two boats in the class, the only two that have currently been completed, only have four missile tubes. But given that four nuclear missiles is still probably going to give most opponents significant pause, the missile count is probably less of a concern than the submarine count. With only two boats completed, it's currently impossible for India to have a continuous at-sea nuclear deterrent. Submarines do need to come back for maintenance and restocking occasionally, and human crews tend to insist on their human frailties being respected. Things like a desire to see natural light at least once a year and maybe occasionally say hello to their families. So what that means is that at the moment, India has a nuclear force that is probably capable of surviving a surprise first nuclear strike by another nuclear weapon state and then retaliating. As long as that opponent is kind enough not to launch the attack while the submarines aren't out on patrol. This is, as you might imagine, not considered optimal from a deterrence perspective. And India is pushing quickly towards that four-boat figure you might remember from the UK and France that represents a minimum viable continuous at-sea nuclear deterrent. As far as is reported, India's plan is to hit that level sometime in the mid to late 2020s, while also then pushing forward the construction of a successor class of much larger, more capable ballistic missile submarines, so far known only as the S-5 class that should enlarge the force further. If you're wondering about the strategic thinking behind India's expanding nuclear arsenal, you might be able to find a small clue in what systems they're choosing to concentrate on. Historically, a lot of focus for India's nuclear deterrent has been similarly nuclear-armed Pakistan. Relatively short-range delivery systems, like aircraft or short-range ballistic missiles, are cost-effective and entirely sufficient given that Pakistan is right there. But a lot of recent Indian nuclear investments have been in systems that are massively overkill for the Pakistan mission. Unless you want your missiles to be able to do some sky-riding manoeuvres before they go after their targets, a new generation of ballistic missiles with ranges of 3,000, 4,000, 5,500 kilometres is complete overkill for the Pakistan mission. At the same time, it's massively undercooked if you're worried about European or American powers. But if you look at that map showing a 5,500 kilometre and 8,000 kilometre radius, you can probably make some educated guesses about what Indian nuclear planners might be worried about. And let's be honest here, it's probably not Indonesia. Similarly, having an oversized continuous at-sea nuclear deterrent might not be necessary if your only concern is Pakistan. That country doesn't have tremendous ISR capabilities or the ability to go hunt and kill nuclear missile submarines on patrol. But now, or especially in the coming years, a force like the People's Liberation Army Navy just might. And so we come to what might be one of the great awkward challenges of Indian nuclear planning. If China expands its nuclear forces with more ICBMs, hypersonic delivery systems, new generation ballistic missile submarines and additional warheads, ostensibly with a goal to moving closer to strategic nuclear parity with the United States, even if their stated purpose is countering the USA, Indian nuclear planners probably can't assume that they come with a little inhibitor switch that prevents them being retargeted towards India in a crisis. And here you have the danger of a phenomenon we haven't really looked at before, 
which is a multipolar arms race. And this is what can happen when there are more than two players in an arms race at any given time. If China builds up in order to move closer towards equilibrium with the United States, in so doing, it also moves out of equilibrium with India. If India then expands its forces and capabilities to move back into strategic equilibrium with China, well, that moves India and Pakistan out of nuclear equilibrium, which causes Pakistan to want to expand. Hypothetically, you can have these feedback loops then continue. If India then looks at itself relative to both China and Pakistan, it might expand in order to move back into strategic equilibria with both of them. But then let's just say some planner in Beijing, for example, decides that really they need enough systems to be able to deal with both India and the United States at the same time. So, of course, they have to expand their arsenal. That might further shift the bilateral balance between China and the United States, causing the United States to think, hey, maybe we need to expand in order to answer this perceived challenge which in turn might cause Beijing to expand, causing India to expand, causing Pakistan to expand, causing India to expand, causing China to expand, causing the US to expand, until eventually the Cold War is back on and school kids can't play cricket because the pitch is being turned into a missile silo. At the moment, I would argue, there's not much sign that we're at that point. India is still, by the standards of most nuclear powers, only building up to the basics of a survivable second strike capability. But the thing to be wary of is that paranoia sort of goes with the territory when it comes to nuclear planning. And so even if someone else says their build-up isn't about you, there's always going to be an argument to say that it might be about you and you should probably prepare just in case. And unless things are properly handled in terms of diplomacy and signalling, there's always a non-zero chance of the whole process running a bit out of control. But even if we hopefully reasonably assume that the region is not immediately going to devolve into a free-for-all, multi-way, all-out nuclear arms race, there are likely to be a lot of demands placed on the Indian military and the defence industrial base that supports it in the coming years. The point I want to explore now is, what are some of the factors that go into explaining why India may or may not be able to meet those requirements? On the plus side, the Indian economy is the fastest growing major economy in the world at the moment, managing more than 6% in real terms in 2023 and projected to do it again in 2024. Apparently, when the rest of the world got the script for 2023, which just read inflation and sadness, India's copy apparently got lost in the mail or something because they're still very much on to the moon settings. The economy is benefiting from French shoring driven investment, discounted incoming oil, not to mention the demographic support of a very young and increasingly educated population. And all of this points to India being a country with absolutely immense economic and military potential. But the key point here is just like a high-performing student, just because a nation has potential doesn't mean there aren't challenges towards realising it. And in many cases, as we'll see with India, sometimes those challenges are at least to some extent self-imposed. For example, one of the great challenges the Indian military operates under is the fact that it just doesn't have that much money. In 2023, India is trying to maintain a military that, in manpower terms, depending on your count, is roughly equivalent to or larger than militaries like those of the United States, the People's Republic of China, or Russia. However, those nations outspend India on national defence by very roughly 10 to 1, 5 to 1, and 1.5 and to 1, respectively. Plus, all three nations realise savings by manufacturing most of their military equipment domestically, and Russia historically has gotten to cheat a little bit when it comes to personnel costs by using a little thing called conscription to fill the ranks. Under ordinary circumstances, no one would probably accept $30 a month to take up an army job, but they will if the alternative is serving time in a Russian prison. As an all-volunteer force, India doesn't have that quote-unquote advantage. And so all else being equal, it might run the risk of being stuck in a modernisation squeeze, where there simply isn't enough funding available to maintain and update equipment, and as a result, the gap in capability between India and the other major military powers only widens over time. However, on paper at least, India should have at least one countervailing advantage over the USA, China and Russia. It's people. And importantly for both the military and the economy, a lot of those people are quite young. You can see the Indian population pyramid from 2020 on the screen there, with the most significant bulge, if you want to call it that, running from the teen years through to the mid-late 20s. Add to that, there is a significant minority of the population who speak English, enabling greater access to the global economy, generally lifting education standards across the country over the last few decades, and the fact that there is a significant share of the population still engaged in relatively low-earning employment, and on paper you have a truly huge pool of young workers who might be attracted to new industries or potentially to military service. And just in case you've forgotten, here's the Russian population pyramid with Ukraines looking somewhat similar. 
While the Indian graph forms an upward pointing arrow, on the Russian chart it looks like the 18 to 33 group has been pounded in from both sides. Which, to be fair, is probably how a lot of people born in the 1990s or early 2000s feel about the whole life thing so far. The core point is that India's demography should be an absolute recruiter's dream. Literally hundreds of millions of young men and women, increasingly educated, that all else being equal, you would expect, would translate into a relatively young, vibrant, affordable force of healthy and capable recruits. You would expect competition for roles would be keeping Indian military salaries and pension requirements down, along with the average age of military service personnel. The question is, is that happening? You know me, presented with a question like that, I can't help but test it statistically. For that, we need a comparator, so I've gone with the US here. As you can see here, the US has a much older population than India, but without that complete collapse in the 18 to 30 age group that we saw in Russia. That means, all else being equal, we should expect the US military perhaps to be a little bit older if it's representative of the population it's recruiting from. Next, we grab some US force demographics from 2021 and discover a couple of things. We discover your average American in uniform is 28.4 years of age, with officers being more than 34 and enlisted being 27.1. We can see the distribution varies by service, with the nerds in Space Force averaging more than 30, while the US Marine Corps are the cradle snatchers of the bunch, with the median Marine being in the youngest age bracket, 18 to 25. There are about 15,000 jokes that can fit there, but given the Marine's reputation for marksmanship, I might hold my fire just this once. Now to complete our baseline, what we need to do is take our American military and make it look like the Indian military, so we're comparing apples to apples. For example, America's ground combat elements, the Army and the Marine Corps, tend to be younger than the other services. In India, the Army makes up about 85% of the regular military, so it wouldn't be fair to compare it to the US force as a whole. Instead, we'll compare them to the average of the US ground combat arms. Then finally, I'm going to adjust for span of control, that is, the ratio between officers and enlisted personnel. In the US, about 20% of active duty are commissioned officers, and they are much older on average than enlisted personnel. In the Indian Army, officers are comparatively much rarer, about 4 or 5% of the overall force. And I dare to guess that for Western veterans, whether that sounds like heaven or hell probably comes down to what rank you wore during your time in service. Fewer officers should mean a younger force, so we do the calculation and we come out with a number. If the US military cut down the chair force, fired the space nerds, purged a bunch of officers and heralded an era of army rule, then you end up with an approximate average age of 26.7. With Indian demography being younger overall, you might expect the figure in India to be lower still. Except, it's not. In 2022, India's Vice Chief of the Army Staff said that the average age in the Indian Army was between 32 and 34. More than that, in 2023, about half of defence spending in India was spent on personnel and pensions, which is significantly higher than in many of the NATO militaries we've looked at previously. Even more significantly, the percentage taken up by pensions has been expanding rapidly. In 2008, according to the IISS, pensions made up about 12.6% of Indian military spending. By 2023, that figure had expanded to 23.3%. And as personnel and pension spending has increased, the squeeze has been placed on capital expenditure. Between 2008 and 2012, India spent about a third of the budget on capital expenditure and modernization. But by 2018 to 2022, that figure was down to 23.4%. With its demography, the Indian military should be relatively young and low cost. But instead, its profile looks closer to something like the Japanese Self-Defense Forces, a force raised and maintained in one of the world's wealthiest and most elderly nations. This is a glaring case of a potential advantage not being translated into an actual advantage. And a lot of it comes down to policy. In those other major militaries we compared India to, most personnel don't go career. Contract troops in Russia or enlisted personnel in the US will sign an initial contract for a certain number of years, and then at the end of that time, they might extend or pass back out into the civilian workforce. Or at least they did before Russia abolished the whole retiring from the military thing in 2022. In the Indian military, however, all personnel were in for the long haul. And after a term of service, which would at minimum be 15 years for enlisted personnel and 20 for officers, Retiring personnel would usually be eligible for a range of benefits, including a pension that might be 50% of their previous salary. As you can imagine, that might have had a lot of implications on how the force looked and how the budget evolved. 
On one hand, it may have made military employment more attractive to some because it represented guaranteed employment and an eventual pension. At the same time, running a seven-figure personnel count and allowing them all to accumulate a pension entitlement was kind of having a mounting impact on the Indian defence budget. And while military living may be hard living, if you're letting blokes accumulate pension rights in their 30s or 40s, you might be paying those pensions for a bloody long time. However, while it is possible for policy to create a problem, it's also sometimes possible for policy to resolve it. The obvious example here would be the Indian military's recent Agnipath or Path of Fire reforms, which, while highly controversial, should probably win a prize for sounding like something straight out of the last airbender. Under the Agnipath program, recruitment of Indian enlisted personnel would start to look a lot more like that in other militaries. Young enlistees would be offered four-year initial contracts, and at the end of that service period, up to 25% of them would be offered a chance to go career with a further 15 years in service. Those who stayed in and stuck it out would get the regular pension, while those who mustered out would get a tax-free severance package, but no lifelong pension. The idea seems to have been to control the expansion of the pension and personnel budget while dropping the age of the force on average. And according to senior Indian figures, once all is said and done, the program should reduce the average age in the Indian military to, you guessed it, around 26 or 27. Pretty close to what we calculated a couple of minutes ago. As I said, these reforms are pretty controversial. They even provoked public demonstrations. It does essentially mean that just getting into the military is no longer the guarantee of long-term employment and a pension that it once was. But from an outsider's perspective, it mostly serves to highlight a point, and that is that historically, while Indian military modernization funding has been getting more and more squeezed by the pension and personnel budget, going forward, there may be potential for the expanding Indian economy to come together with reform efforts like this one, to create room in the Indian defence budget for the sort of research and procurement funding that the force probably needs. And so now we start to get into the stuff that I know you're all really here for. India's defence industry, arms suppliers, and then the fascinating ongoing Bollywood drama known as Indian defence procurement. Now, unlike many of its major power peers like the United States, Russia or China, since independence, India's approach to getting military hardware has largely been based on importing it from abroad, while a domestic industry capable of meeting India's military requirements is steadily built up. India's approach to acquiring the Russian T-90S tank, for example, included first buying a number of fully built tanks from Russia, then purchasing kits which would be assembled in Indian factories, and then steadily moving over to local production that was more and more indigenized, that using more and more components that had been produced in India rather than imported from Russia. That's the theoretical approach, but as we'll get to in a minute, things don't always go that way. But what it does mean is while Indian military industrial capacity and human capital is being built up, in the interim, India still has to import a lot of hardware, making it the world's largest arms importer. Historically, that's largely meant arms imports from the Soviet Union and then later from Russia. Although, as you might recall from our discussion of the Air Force in particular, there was a lot of European export activity as well. But as much as the agreements on things like Jaguar and Mirage were important, India's attachment to Soviet and post-Soviet hardware has historically gone very, very deep. In fact, historically, India has liked Russian equipment so much that it often operates more of it than the Russians themselves do. There are more Sukhoi 30s flying in India than there are in Russia. And likewise, India's inventory of T-90s is significantly larger than the Russian equivalent. But just as in fashion or music, preferences in the arms sector change over time. The graph on screen here probably says it all. That red line represents Russian arms imports into India over a given five-year period as a share of overall imports. This data is based on the SIPRI Trend Indicator Value Database, which I will link in the description. In the 2008-12 period, Russia was the Microsoft office of Indian arms imports. Dominant, omnipresent, seemingly impossible to shift and commanding north of 70% market share. In 2013-17, however, that share declined to closer to 60%. And by 2018 to 2022, Russia was looking more like AOL after broadband started to hit the market. It no longer had a majority market share, and the trend wasn't looking good. There might have been ways for Russia to try and arrest that decline, but the war in Ukraine is probably going to make that difficult. Namely, because right now Russia needs all the weapons it can produce for itself and doesn't exactly have spares to be selling abroad. Earlier this year, for example, Indian Air Force representatives made a statement to an Indian parliamentary committee saying that at least one major planned delivery of Russian military equipment scheduled for this year wouldn't happen. And while delays are sometimes to be expected, military hardware usually isn't treated like buying some cheap clothing from a dodgy dropshipping site. 
If you order a Sukhoi 30 for 2024 and in fact get a MiG-21 in 2026, no one's going to call fair play and say it was relatively cheap anyway. Seizing Russian market share, the biggest beneficiaries, as you can see there in the light blue, are countries of the European Union. Overwhelmingly, that's the French moving in with their sale of systems like Rafale. And then in white, Israel selling a variety of systems, including those that are routinely used to upgrade imported Russian hardware. India's A50 AWACS derivatives from Russia, for example, carry an Israeli sensor package, not the original Russian one. In the future, German companies are also one to watch when it comes to the Indian market. India wants industrial partners to help build submarines, submarines are expensive, and if there are two things that German industry can do well, it's expensive and submarines. But focusing on who is shipping weapons to India is in some ways burying the lead of India's procurement story. Yes, India is a massive market in the defence sector, and yes, the friendships and alliances there are changing. But if you're looking for factors that really, I would argue, influence the combat power of the Indian military, where equipment is purchased from is probably less important than the fact that for many, many years now, the Indian military has constantly struggled with actually getting stuff purchased and fielded at all. The what and the why of these constant train wrecks, some of which stand amongst the best Canadian and German military procurement has to offer, is so involved that I really hope that I have an excuse one day to do an entire video on the subject. But for now, I'm just going to give you a simplified picture, introducing you to the four horsemen of the Indian defence procurement apocalypse. Budgets, requirements, indigenization, and everyone's favourite, bureaucratic procedure. So far as the budget goes, we've already covered some of the core pressures. India maintains a military roughly the same size as the United States or China, while also having a fraction of the budget. Of the most recent approximately 74 billion US dollar Indian defence budget, only about 27% was allocated for capital modernization and infrastructure. 27% is already a pretty low share, especially when it has to cover things like infrastructure on the disputed border with China so that military units can actually deploy and be sustained there. Then, if you're the Indian military, the challenge gets even more acute for two distinct reasons. Firstly, because there is a lot of older equipment in service that is going to need to be replaced. And secondly, because a lot of that funding is not going to be for new programs, but rather those that have already been approved. Given the mismatch between the budget and the size of the Indian military, in many ways, this situation is understandable. But it also means that if you are planning these budgets going forward, you are going to have to be ruthless. Spending will absolutely have to be focused on the most essential, the most efficient purchases. And that probably means buying lots of cheap, cost-effective, proven equipment that can definitely be manufactured with the cooperation of the Indian industrial base. 20 billion per annum for a military this size is not a BMW budget. In military procurement terms, this is more 2005 Toyota Corolla money. Doable, but with absolutely no frills. Which leads to horseman number two, the fact that the Indian military bloody loves frills. A lot of the time, it seems, they don't want a 2005 Corolla. They want a Maserati supercar to be modified to multi-purpose as a submarine. In the Indian procurement space, you often see a lot of finger pointing from the military towards the civilian ministry. And as we'll cover in a moment, sometimes that might have some merit to it. But one area where the military is squarely in control when procuring a new product is setting the QRs, the qualitative requirements. That is, the evaluation of what a thing you're trying to buy should be able to do, what performance standards it needs to hit before it can be considered success, purchased and put into service. The goal here, of course, would be to set requirements that are as accurate and efficient as possible. Instead, to borrow the words of a former Indian Defence Minister, the military has often drafted requirements that seem, quote, straight out of Marvel comic books, end quote. When India needed a new indigenous assault rifle for its military to replace the disappointment that was the INSAS, the military decided that it needed to be the world's first service rifle that was multi-caliber. The rifle needed to be able to fire 5.56 NATO, 7.62 by 39 Soviet, and 6.8 Remington, with little more than a barrel and magazine change. This, as you can imagine, clashed with the ideal of building an affordable, reliable service weapon. And by the time Indian designers had actually managed to come up with a system that could do exactly what the army asked for, the military had already gone and ordered more than 70,000 Swiss assault rifles that notably were not multi-caliber, and then later ordered 70,000 more. The tendency towards gold plating requirements sometimes extends even beyond the best that is available in the world at any given time. Submarines with stealth and sensor capabilities that go beyond anything even the United States Navy is believed to have fielded. And in the case of the air defense gun and missile system, requirements that were so extensive that, in the words of one potential supplier, quote, the Army's QRs demanded an operational capability from the ADGMS that was unrealistic and simply unavailable, end quote. 
And arguably even worse from a delay and cost perspective, those requirements can continue to change throughout the design process. Now, this might come as a surprise to some of you, but people on the internet can get pretty passionate when you start talking about main battle tanks. So you'll forgive me if I tread a little carefully in this next segment as we talk about India's indigenous main battle tank, the Arjun, as compared to its imported and then locally produced T-90s from Russia. The thing is, I'm not here to tell you whether or not Arjun is a good tank or not. I'm not a tanker. But what I can tell you is parts of the story of its development and requirements read like bureaucratic torture. According to a 2014 report by the Comptroller and Auditor General of India, the design was meant to be frozen, that is, no further changes, by 2004. But clearly someone took that as a guideline rather than an actual rule because 316 further amendments would be made by August 2010. One example given by the report is that in 2007, after production of Arjun had already begun, the military added two additional requirements for Arjun. First, that it be possible to prepare a tank for fording operations, that is, crossing a water obstacle, in 30 minutes or less, and that when doing so, the amount of water ingress, that is, how much water could get inside the tank, be minimised to exactly zero. That required modifications to the design and to future and existing tanks. Produced vehicles had to be dismantled, reworked and reassembled, but the Ministry justified the changes, saying they were, quote, essential to improve overall performance from the user's perspective, end quote. The interesting point for me here isn't that there are late changes being made into the design, although those are obviously going to cause delays and expenses. It isn't even the fact that someone apparently decided that it was worth investing in order to keep water ingress to a minimum. It's the fact that those requirements on the Arjun, which were described as essential to improve performance, were not imposed on other Indian main battle tanks, in particular the T-90. And the report goes on to highlight many of the other ways in which the requirements placed on Arjun were harsher than those put on T-90. It was essential that Arjun be able to climb a 35 degree gradient. T90 only had to do 30 degrees. Arjun had to be able to reverse at 20 kilometers per hour for T90 was okay if it could do 10. Arjun had to have zero water ingress when crossing a water obstacle. For T90, it was two and a half liters. The course for harsh terrain testing for Arjun was described as harsher than that for the T90. The requirements for laser rangefinder accuracy on Arjun were far more stringent. And the list goes on with the table being presented on screen there. My point is not just is gold plating occurring, it's arguably occurring inconsistently. But either way, the results for the Indian military are often that a procurement might fall through or be withdrawn, meaning that for want of an available superweapon, the service is often left using something positively ancient. Going back to the air defence gun and missile system, for example, the requirements were so stringent that one executive apparently described them as being difficult, if not impossible, to meet. The Indian military reportedly got fairly close to purchasing an advanced South Korean self-propelled anti-aircraft gun, but when that fell through because that system couldn't meet the requirements, they had to fall back on what they already had. And part of what they had in service were 40mm Bofors anti-aircraft guns, the design of which dated back to before the Second World War. To oversimplify it, you could argue the military asked for 2030s era technology, was offered something from the 2010s, and because the latter fell short, ultimately decided to revert to the 1940s. Slow clapping in the audience is at this point welcome. Horseman number three is the very understandable goal of increasing Indian self-reliance. This expresses itself in a couple of ways. Firstly, if you want to sell into the Indian market, you're going to have a much better time of it if you go in with an Indian domestic partner, and your proposal involves things like the transfer of knowledge, information, and domestic manufacturing in India. It means buying things from abroad has a very different procurement process to manufacturing them domestically in the various places in between. It often includes offset obligations, so if you're selling hardware into India, you're expected to make, for example, certain investments into Indian manufacturing to compensate. And notably, it includes outright bans on certain categories of equipment. The idea here might make sense. You don't want a foreign company choosing to import a foreign laser rangefinder, for example, if a perfectly acceptable Indian one is available. The challenges, however, with getting this right are probably obvious on their face. Impose a restriction when your domestic alternative isn't up to international standards and you may have underperforming equipment. If you only have one or two domestic suppliers for a piece of technology and suddenly foreign competition is shut out of the market, well, they might choose to take the government for a bit of a ride. And when you are talking about a foreign, proven piece of military equipment, redesigning it in order to accept the indigenous components may suddenly be introducing cost and technical risk that just wouldn't be there if you took the design as is. Just ask the British and how that went with the Ajax. Increasing self-reliance is a very understandable policy objective, but it's one that can be both expensive and slow. For example, in the 1980s, the Indian government reached agreements with Czech firm Tatra, 
The goal was to produce their vehicles in India using greater and greater shares of Indian components over time. The goal by 1991 was 86% indigenization. Production would eventually get to a reported 62.5% indigenization after a slight delay to 2010. The pressure for greater self-reliance, industry policy and capability to all come together have resulted in very complex and constantly changing defence acquisition procedures. The 2016 DAP, which I had a chance to read, divided procurements into six primary categories, including make, buy global, buy and make, buy and make but make Indian, buy hyphen Indian, and buy Indian design, developed and manufactured. But for some impossible to fathom reason, it seems that some readers decided that might be confusing and could potentially do with some simplification. The Defence Acquisition Procedure 2020, which is also about 700 pages of engaging reading for anyone interested, simplified those six procurement categories down to five, and then added one more called leasing. Leasing, in turn, got divided into two subcategories, Lease Indian and Lease Global. You might be shocked to hear that one of the challenges with these procedures is that they can be difficult and complex to navigate, both for the Indian government and also potential vendors meaning that while there is an obvious policy goal for the DAP and things seem to have improved version by version, the more complex the procedure, the greater all else being equal, the cost and risk associated with administering and implementing them. And so what happens when all four of those horsemen decide to come together at the same time? Because if they do, and you're a foreign defence supplier wanting to get a piece of the largest arms import market on the planet, you might find yourself facing a set of requirements that, for the sake of this argument, we're going to say are entirely hypothetical. The Indian government is affording you the incredible opportunity to build them a new submarine. It must be the best submarine on the planet, the greatest that has ever sailed anywhere. Technologically, this thing has to be one step short of spontaneously transforming into Optimus Prime and effectively invulnerable to any foreign system or countermeasure. Having designed this submarine, which must, aside from being the world's best, also have been proven by multiple years in service, you're going to have to find an Indian industry partner because you're going to have to build the thing in India. In doing so, you're going to have to transfer all of your trade secrets and intellectual property in that submarine design to an Indian company. You will own 49% of the joint venture and have no actual overriding operational control over those shipyards. However, if anything goes wrong in the manufacturing at those shipyards, you are financially responsible for the failure. Also, just for good measure, this is a fantastic opportunity for your company to innovate and expand its production techniques because you're going to have to do that in order to deliver this thing within budget, considering the budget is significantly below the global benchmark pricing for the type of equipment in question. When, for some strange reason, no company comes forward with the design that meets the underlying requirements, then either the tender will be extended on the apparent assumption that companies around the world must only be one or two years away from achieving the optical cloaking device and hyperdrive technologies called for in the QRs, or the tender will be cancelled, the existing equipment kept in service, and a new one issued. The problem of asking industry to do too much, too quickly, with too little, has arguably pervaded many Indian projects. In 1983, for example, India initiated the Lightweight Combat Aircraft Project. The idea was that India's ageing MiG-21s from the Soviet Union, which had first started entering service in the 1960s, would age out in the 1990s and required a modern replacement. Due to various delays, the first prototype of what would become the Tejas would fly in 2001, with the first aircraft introduced into service in 2015, reaching 2016 in-service examples in 2022, and the annual production rate increasing from 16 to 24 per annum in 2023. There are a huge number of interesting things that could be said about the LCA program, but one of the most ambitious elements was to have it powered by a domestic Indian aircraft engine. This was incredibly ambitious, because on the spectrum of easy to hard when it comes to defence manufacturing, fighter jet power plants are about as difficult as it gets. There is a reason that until recently that despite its immense resources, the People's Republic of China was still importing engines for its combat aircraft from Russia. And when you're talking about a single-engine fighter, the demands are even greater. A fighter engine has to be extremely high performance, lightweight, and because you've only got one of them, reliability is also non-negotiable. So as you can imagine, designing a next-generation engine to meet those requirements would be an enormous undertaking, which was why, in 1989, Indian industry was given 93 months and 48 million US dollars to do it. As we just established, fighter power plants are not exactly entry-level engineering. So assigning that sort of timeline and budget to an industry with only limited experience in building jet engines was kind of like deciding that you wanted to take up woodwork as a hobby 
and that for your first or second practice exercise, you were going to manufacture a one-to-one scale replica of a Napoleonic ship of the line in your backyard over the course of a couple of weekends using the five bucks that you found in one of your coat pockets. As you can imagine, development time and cost obviously blew out. By 2004, costs had risen to $162 million US and often required patching with foreign technology, for example, bringing in French blades and electronic control systems. By 2010-11, the Comptroller and Auditor General found that the program hit two of its six performance milestones and it spent nearly a quarter of a billion dollars. And in 2016, as part of the offsets for the Indian purchase of the French Rafale, French engine manufacturers were brought in to help revive the program. But all of those efforts, delays and cost overruns were obviously worth it. Because the Tejas has now entered Indian service, is increasing its production rate, and by all accounts is performing relatively well. Powered by imported American General Electric F404 engines, reportedly costing Hindustan Aeronautics Limited more than the entire development cost of the Kaveri engine up to that point. Because the airframe was ready, India needed the aircraft, and after something like 30 years in development, the Indian engine still wasn't ready. Nor, one might argue, should it have been, considering that even Tony Stark would probably struggle to build a high-performance fighter jet engine from scratch for less than the cost of a single F-35. Now, I know, I know, I rant a lot about procurement. And a lot of time, people don't want to hear about the cost overruns or delays, just the performance characteristic of the latest and greatest piece of equipment to enter into service. But in the case of India, I think, if you're doing a holistic analysis, you would do well not to ignore it. Because, as you're probably getting as we go through some of these examples, delays, overruns, procurement difficulties, and overambitious programs all have knock-on costs. And some of those costs, I would argue, can have very significant consequences. The LCA program was originally meant to provide an aircraft that could replace India's aging MiG-21s. Even as those airframes started horrendously aging out despite their upgrades, the LCA was not available to replace them. At the same time, the Indian Air Force was already significantly under strength in terms of aircraft numbers, so it couldn't just retire the MiG-21 anyway. So, in part due to the absence of a replacement, MiG-21 kept flying. Not just through the 1990s, but through the 2000s, the 2010s, and continues to fly in small numbers to this day in 2023. And keeping them in service was correlated with an important issue. While I would never attribute a specific cause to it, there is a fact that stands out. These things crash a lot. The sources I found suggest that India manufactured a bit over 800 MiG-21s. Over the last 60 years, about 400 of those have crashed, reportedly killing more than 200 pilots and civilians. Just in 2021, for example, according to one news report I found, MiG-21s would crash in January, March, May, August, and December. Three of those five crashes reportedly had aircrew fatalities. These crashes impose a very real human cost, both on the individuals involved and the Indian Air Force. For reasons of time, I obviously can't pay my respects to all of the aircrew involved in all of these crashes. But to give just one example, when I looked up the two officers killed in the 28 July 2022 MiG-21 crash, I found that one of the two officers lost, Wing Commander Mohit Rana, was a 16-year veteran of the Indian Air Force who had been a Wing Commander since 2018. A 2021 crash claimed the life of Group Captain Ashish Gupta, a senior officer with more than 19 years of valuable experience. Obviously, all lives lost in accidents are tragedies. I'm sure India likewise mourns Flight Lieutenant Bal, who also died in that July 2022 crash. But my point is that these aircraft are often being lost, not at the hands of new trainees, but experienced pilots. And while it's obviously impossible to say what would have happened if these aircraft had long ago been replaced by a more modern, potentially safer design, I imagine there are those who ask the question. Getting procurement right isn't just about balancing budgets. It's about maintaining deterrence. It's about preventing wars. And it's about the lives and safety of those who choose to put on the uniform. And so if you ever wonder why I choose to focus on it, there's my case. And here's the flip side observation to close it all out when you're talking about Indian procurement. While programs often seem to fall into the trap of trying to go too far too fast with too little, when the target is set appropriately, the goalposts aren't moved and the process effectively run, it's hard to take away from some of the incredible things that Indian industry is capable of accomplishing. To take just one example, the US is budgeting more than 400 million US dollars to go back to the moon. The Russians cut costs by spending more than $200 million to fail to do so and instead smack their probe into the lunar surface. 
whereas the Indian space program, by sticking pretty closely to a previous mission profile, sending a relatively small lander and keeping their eyes on the prize, managed a successful mission for about 75 million US dollars. The pattern sometimes holds true with military equipment as well. Usually, when the product chosen is within the reasonable capabilities of Indian industry, foreign support is available if required, and when the funding goal in question doesn't call for the creation of a next-generation fighter engine for a cost less than some New York apartments. So for the final time in this video, I'll make this observation. There's reason to believe that India has immense military potential. Many of the fundamental inputs are already there. What will be interesting to observe in the coming years is whether the budgets, practices, and systems that often hold back that potential remain in place, or whether the Indian defence sector is allowed to rise and thrive alongside the broader Indian economy. In conclusion, India is already a major military power, and one whose capabilities are likely to expand alongside the Indian economy. The country has a massive army, large air force, expanding navy, a modernising and evolving nuclear arsenal, and a domestic defence industry that is steadily expanding its capabilities. However, at the same time, Indian defence planners face a number of challenges. Namely, the growing power of China, greater cooperation between Beijing and Islamabad, the growing demands of competition in the Indo-Pacific, and a tendency towards what might be described as underfunded, overly ambitious research development and production efforts that have often held back attempts at Indian force modernization and the development of Indian industry. How the Indian force and defence industry are trying to evolve to meet those challenges is an interesting story, but given we're more than an hour in, probably also one for another time. And okay, we have a channel update to close out. And I really hope you enjoyed this one because no video I have ever done spent more time in research than this one. Looking at English language content about the Indian military on YouTube, I basically came to the conclusion pretty quickly that there are two schools of thought as to how you get a big audience when you're talking about India. The first is to focus on the India Strong narrative where every weapon system developed or built in India is an absolute world beater. The other is to go after a very different audience by picking on Indian military equipment and basically calling it complete trash. With this video, I was very determined to avoid both those extremes. I wanted to capture the fact that, in my opinion, the Indian military is a large and capable force, and that the Indian defence sector is capable of designing and producing some very impressive stuff at low cost under the right conditions. But at the same time, not to shy away from the fact that the country's military is still short a lot of investment in modernisation, and that the country has a significant record of procurement missteps. I wanted to tell that story, albeit from a foreign perspective, as fairly as I could. And I'm still hoping that in the next few weeks, this video will be translated into languages other than English. So as always, getting the core facts right was very important to me. To that end, I have spent months working through Indian Defence Acquisition Procedure, reports by the Comptroller and Auditor General of India on defence acquisitions, as well as sometimes calling in assistance to get through the volume of material involved, and while most who helped don't want to be thanked publicly, there was actually one YouTuber in the mix, so my great thanks go to Tex. You may know the bloke for his Battletech videos, but he's also a talented gunsmith with a surprising background in Indian small arms. There are more comments I could make, but given the time, let me cut straight to this. We're getting close to the end of the year now, something that's only been made possible by your ongoing support of the channel. Those hours spent going through India's 2020 DAP were only possible because you're here every week clicking on and watching these videos. So from the bottom of my heart, let me close out this week with my great thanks, my best wishes for all of you for the rest of the year, and I hope to see you all again next week.